most of us have some kind of reaction to the word evangelism, which talks about sharing our faith. Some of you have seen this done well, and, and, and that's great. Uh, I just want to be honest and say a lot of us have seen this done poorly. Uh, in some kind of a manipulative, abusive, backhanded way, hopefully not as extreme as this. Uh, but we've seen it done poorly. Uh, and it's left a really kind of bitter taste in our mouths. Uh, of course, television cameras and news crews often find the most outspoken Christians. And, and sometimes we find them waving placards and holding signs and displaying t-shirts that have messages that I would humbly suggest to you don't sound very much like good news if you were on the receiving end. And I think we have uh, something that complicates this further, and that's our Canadian culture celebrates faith and spirituality as long as you keep it to yourself. If, if you have spirituality and faith, we, 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 this is good for you. But the minute you open your mouth to share this with other people, that's a little arrogant, right? And it, it, it talks down to people around us. Uh, you know what? Uh, if I had to, I've been tempted to ask for a show of hands, but I won't. But it, I'm t I suspect most of us are more intimidated by the idea of sharing our faith than we would be excited by it, if we were honest. Most of us are, are more intimidated about this than we are excited. Uh, and with that in mind, as we kind of get into a topic for the day, uh, let me read you something from Romans chapter 1. This is one of the early followers of Jesus. His name is Paul. And he writes the following here. I'm in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 20 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Why is he excited? He goes on. He goes, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. In fact, if we backtrack through the, the opening verses of this chapter, Paul's already talked about the gospel or the good news four other times. He honestly can't shut up about it. It's just kind of who he is. Why is he so passionate and outspoken about the good news? And he tells us to some degree, he said, because it is the power of God. It is the power of God. In fact, the... the the word power that's used here in Greek is the root word from which we get our word dynamite. It's literally God's explosive, life-transforming energy. But while we acknowledge that dynamite destroys, God's power heals, it restores, it reconciles, it changes minds, it changes hearts, it renews and restores relationships. Paul says, I'm excited to share this because I see what happens when God's power gets a hold of somebody's life. The good news is God's explosive power. But there's something else I just want to point out here. It's available to everyone, but not everyone will receive it. The good news is there for all who will believe. The good news invites a response of some kind. And I think there's an implication with this that we shouldn't miss, and that's this. The gospel or the good news of Jesus is a message with content, which means if all we ever do is live good news lives but never open our mouths, we're leaving people with an incomplete story. Uh, we said last week, preach the gospel on all occasions and if you have to, use words. Uh, and it's a great way of reminding ourselves that the greatest impact and influence happens when, when, a person's, when the story of their life lines up with the words that come out of their mouth. We want to be people who literally practice what we preach. And so we've spent the first month of this fall season trying to talk and motivate ourselves towards habits that help our lives tell that good news story. If I had my way, I would say, I think the good news should be seen before it's heard. But don't misunderstand me. For people to see the good news without ever hearing about it, we're not telling a story that's any different from any other good moral person or faith-based perspective in our world today. The good news is a message that also needs to be heard in order for people to respond to it. And the question, of course, is so what happens when living practical good news lives a blessing eventually, occasionally, of people turning and looking at us and saying, why would you do that? 
now's your opportunity. And we've already had this happen a little bit in our own home because uh, there's at least a few things both Sean and I would say we, we've had happen as a result of kind of trying to take blessing steps that we would go, I would do differently if I could do it again. Um, and part of this is we, we're not always ready for this. Somebody turns and asks you, why would you do that? And you go, I, I wasn't ready to say that. And it's why we want to change our conversation a little bit or build on it here in the coming weeks. Jeff was already saying, we're tracking through Ontario-based pastor and writer Bruxy Cavey's book, Reunion. It's a book about how to have good news conversations with people. One of the things I love about it is not just his thoughtful, engaging way of writing, but he speaks to a Canadian context and culture. That's just a reality for our lives. And so I think there's value in that. We're encouraging you quite literally to be on the same page with us, if at all possible, which is why we've made at least 50 copies of these books available. Uh, we're selling them for 20 bucks flat. I think we're down to about 10 left. So if you want, feel free to swing by. Once we're sold out, I'm going to direct you to Kennedy's Parable. You'll have to order your own, and they will cost you a little bit more. Note to self. So uh, we're tracking through the first five chapters of his book today. And for those of you I know who are playing catch up with your reading, don't panic. The pace will slow down from here. We're kind of jumping into the introductory pieces. And from here, it'll just be one chapter. So I'm, I'm optimistic if you're not exactly at chapter five yet, you'll be able to catch up in the weeks to come. But if you're ready, the conversation we want to join in or jump into today is this. If you have an opportunity to share the good news, how might we consider doing that in one word or three words? What, what's the most simple way we can talk about our faith? You ready for this? Oh, boy. Okay, well, I am. I'm going for it. <laughs> Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. One of the biographies of Jesus. I'm going to refer to a few of the verses in the Gospel of John, so feel free to turn there if you want. John, chapter 1, verse 14, he writes the following. He says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us we have seen his glory the glory of the one and only who came from the father full of grace and truth and if you're tracking in your bibles you will see that the word word is capitalized it's a, a form of personification john is attributing character and personhood to what he's talking about and the jews understood this it was a common way for them to refer to god if we jumped back john has just earlier said the word was with god in the beginning and the word was God and this word from God wrapped itself in human form and came to earth and friends his name is help me out that's absolutely right Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 puts it this way it says referring to Jesus he is the image of the invisible God we haven't seen God you want a picture of what God looks like you look at Jesus the word wrapped itself God's good news became a person let's keep going with the gospel of john john chapter 14 now verse 6 jesus is teaching he says the following he says i am the way the truth and the life because no one can come to god the father except through me how many of you are familiar with the expression the medium is the message like it was marshall McLuhan who coined it uh, it's a way of saying Sometimes the way we communicate, the way a message is delivered, is as important as just the words that are used. And in this case, I, I think that is quite literally the truth. God's message came to us in a person. And you have to think about this with me for a minute. If we had all the teachings of Jesus but not the living example, the message would be incomplete it wouldn't be enough. We need the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. That part of the message, the living example of the message, to complete the story. God didn't send us another prophet with words to tell us about God. Jesus didn't claim to teach us truth. He didn't claim to point us in the direction of life or to point us in the direction of a way. He said, I am all of those things. God became a person, and God's message to us is the life of that person. If you're still tracking with me, flip a few pages. John chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus is praying with his disciples. It's near the end of his life, and Jesus says the following. He says, now this is eternal life. Now, I don't know about you. When somebody sets that up on the, you know, that ball on the tee, I'm about to tell you what eternal life is. I'm thinking we should pay attention. Because now this is eternal life, that they may know you, 
the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have to tell you that's not what I expect to read. There's no list of sacrifices, rules, rituals, obligations. Jesus says eternal life is knowing God and knowing Jesus. Now let's be clear about something. In Jewish culture to know somebody was not just looking up their Facebook page. Okay, or, or reading their mail, or observing them from a distance. It, it implied a deep and intimate personal relationship with the individual. It's why in Jewish culture they could use the expression to know someone, if you have old King James Bibles, as, as a way of saying to have sex with. And I'm sorry for you can cover your kids' ears. Oh, too late? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> make for good conversation later. Uh, they could use it because it speaks of an intimacy, of a personal relationship that's not a knowledge about, but is experienced alongside. This is what Jesus is saying. Eternal life is personal, intimate relationship with God that is made possible through Jesus Christ. And with respect, I was just thinking about it, because this is, uh, if you've ever uh, bumped into some Jehovah's Witnesses, this is a really critical verse for them. Uh, and I've stumbled into this before. I was pulling my, my copy of their New World Translation off my shelf this past week. But this verse for them says, now this is eternal life, the taking in of knowledge. And the focus is on correct belief, on information. But what's missing is the personal relational piece. And I, I believe very strongly they're, they're incorrect on this one. They've missed the heart of what Jesus is trying to communicate. But friends... God became a person. His message is, the, is embodied in the life of that person. Eternal life is relationship with that person. And his name is. We haven't begun to talk about the good news until we've had a chance to talk about Jesus. The gospel in one word is Jesus. And if somebody ever turns and looks at you because you just did something practical and blessing, and they say, why would you do that? You have an opportunity in a small, non-intrusive, non-manipulative way, hopefully, to say something about Jesus. Now, I would love to build on this a little bit. Can we do the gospel in three words? Yes. Romans chapter 10. I want to introduce you to one of the earliest Christian creeds. A creed is, I uh, call it a summary statement of kind of what people believe. And I have good news for you. This is a short one. How many of you are really, really bad memorizers? You will walk out the doors remembering this. Am I, am I being too optimistic? Three words. Paul writes the following. He says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. You want the good news in three words? Jesus is Lord. And because I get to talk a little bit, I just, I just, let me walk you through the three words, because each one brings something to the table here. All right? Now, we've been talking about Jesus. I don't feel the need to, to go too much more into depth here. But to say Jesus is to say we are talking about a real person. A life that was rooted in real history, that God actually became one of us. We aren't talking about another prophet with a message from God. We aren't talking about some spiritual life force. We're talking about a person. In fact, if you think about it this way, you and I have historical evidence, we believe, that the creator of this universe loves us literally to death. That's what we mean when we say the word Jesus. Jesus is. You're going to talk about a two-letter word? Yeah, I am. Think this, It would change profoundly if we said Jesus was Lord. Now, now we could look back in the rearview mirror. We could remember. We could recall fondly, nostalgically. We could talk about something that had happened, but there's no present reality for us. We could say Jesus will be. Lord. And again, I feel we're missing something. We could anticipate, we could look forward with hopeful and enthusiasm to a coming day, but it doesn't touch us now. To say Jesus is 
is to say something significant. And you'll notice Paul ties this immediately together with the reality of the resurrection. You can't say Jesus is without that. He says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. History is littered with examples of people who gave their lives in the service of others. We believe only one came back to tell about it. Jesus, to say Jesus is, is to acknowledge not only that God became humanity, but that he proved it. And he demonstrated his love by living, by dying, but also by rising again. Oh, and by the way, this is a little bit of my own soapbox here too. I, quite often when Christians talk about the good news, it's presented in a way where the benefits of salvation apply to a person only after they die. And I'll explain. So what we tend to do is people would go, why should I become a Christian? And the answer is, don't you want to go to heaven? Can I say something? That's horribly short-sighted. That's almost as foolish as saying you should get married so you can be with your spouse in the afterlife. Why would you get married? If Jesus is, there are implications and relational elements we get to enjoy and are invited into starting now. It just continues after we die. We, we have to stop presenting this as, as an option that we, the benefits come to us only after we die. It, it's, it's just wrong. Jesus is, and we are invited to enjoy fellowship with God now. Let's talk about Lord. First century Jewish culture, this word could have three different meanings, actually. It could refer to kind of a, a title of respect in the way that we might say, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, right? Uh, Mr. Wittenberg, Pastor Andrew. There, there's ways that we do this, right, to kind of like just designate respect. Mr. Pratt, do you get that in your classroom, I assume? People don't get to call you Dave. Not, yeah, not more than <laughs> He said not more than once, for those of you that didn't hear that. That's perfect. <laughs> title, you could say Lord is a title of respect. It could also be a synonym, could be used to equate to be talking about God. Uh, and depending how you use it in a sentence would dictate that. So if we talked about Lord of creation, we would understand it's not just a title of respect. We're talking now about God. But there's a third way this word could be used. And it was used to kind of designate or talk about authority over so it could refer to someone who is a leader, who is a mentor, uh, who is a master. So a slave, for example, would refer to their owner as their lord. Why? Because they live in submission and in obedience to the will of their master. Now the question we should ask is which one of these three is Paul likely referring to when he says, Jesus is Lord? And I think the answer is all three. We've already established to say Jesus is, is to accept that Jesus is God. Certainly if we understand there's, uh, you know, it's, it's important sometimes on a human level to, to designate respect. We would certainly say that would be appropriate with God. But this is the most important piece. To say Jesus is Lord is to also acknowledge that he becomes our leader, our mentor, our master, the one we endeavor to follow and learn from and pattern our lives after. Paul says, if you say Jesus is Lord, if you confess that with your mouth, you are saved. And one of the things I've often kind of wondered is, so is this like a magical formula? Like any, like you can just say these words and, and that's it? And I think the answer is no. And the answer is no quite simply because ancient writers, uh, to ancient writers, words were a sign of what was in someone's heart. So it wasn't just about saying the words, but about if you actually believed and owned this. And if I could paraphrase, I would say it this way. For someone to say and believe Jesus is Lord is really to be saying or declaring Jesus is my Lord. And if you can say that, you've begun a relationship, we believe, with God. How many of you are familiar with the board game Othello? <laughs> We play this occasionally in our home. You probably can't read it from here. That's the game. Uh, it, the, the slogan of Othello is this, a minute to learn, a lifetime to master. And it's a fabulous slogan because you can, the, the rules are almost so idiotically simple. You, you can literally play this with like a six-year-old. It, it's that simple. But strategically, 
knowing it and, and being good at it are two different things. You, you, can, you can spend the rest of your life developing and growing in your gameplay ability. And I think this is a fabulous illustration in a small way for the gospel message, for the good news. In, at its simplest form, a child can understand it and respond to it. It's why so often, and I could ask for a show of hands, I'm one of these stories, I would say, I, I became a Jesus follower when I was five. How much of Jesus did I understand at five? Well, not much. Right? Was it enough to begin a journey and a relationship? And I think the answer is yes. The good news does not need to start with theological books. It starts with Jesus and somebody who might be interested in following him. It is simple enough a child can get it. But have I exhausted everything I can learn about Jesus? Do I even begin to scratch the surface of all the possible implications and whatever that, that, that come from a relationship with him? Not even close. I, I can't even say that about my wife. And that, that's from a human perspective. That's the beauty of relationships. We spend the rest of our lives growing and developing an appreciation for how we interact and learn from each other. What do we do with this? Said at the outset, our col a culture celebrates spirituality as, as long as we keep it to ourselves. Right? And I suspect, and I, I'm speaking personally in this case as much as anyone, I, I'm guilty of sometimes falling into that, that default setting, that I'll live my faith and others will see it, and I don't want to offend people, so I, I'll just, I, I, I'll, I won't say anything. And I need to use somebody as an example here just for fun. Harold, can I pick on you for just a minute? You don't have to say anything. I, I just need you to stand up for a minute. I want, I want you to know something about Harold here. Harold knows a cure for cancer. Anybody interested? <laughs> How many of you have had loved ones suffer or pass away from cancer? Now, here's my question. I need to tell you something else about Harold. Harold is a little shy, and he's a little afraid of, of what you might think of him. Uh, if he shared the cure for cancer. So he's not. He, he, he would just prefer to kind of keep it to himself. Now my question for you is, how do you feel about that? Sorry, there's going to be people chasing you later. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a Coke in my fridge. I'll pay you back. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> is that a loving or an unloving posture to take? I think sometimes, and I, I, I speak personally, I think sometimes I am guilty of forgetting. We, we would say, if, if I knew a cure for cancer, I have a moral obligation to share that with the world. Moral obligation. And my, I, I just, how much more powerful and life transforming is the good news of Jesus? You and I both need reminders sometimes. That is the message that we are entrusted with, that God says is our responsibility. Now, it doesn't mean we should do it poorly. It doesn't mean we should offend people in the process. But we have an obligation to do more than live it out. So two thoughts. And I was, was just chewing on this a little bit. But there are plenty of examples of sharing the good news done poorly. Let's just acknowledge that. There are lots of bad examples. But the antidote to bad evangelism is not shutting up ourselves. If we shut up, I fear that the majority of examples are poor. The cure is letting people see good examples. Which brings me to the fear I suspect most of us have. If we're really honest and we somehow can plumb down into our hearts, I am afraid that in my good intentions, I will inadvertently be one of the bad examples I'm trying so hard not to be. Anyone else have that? I'm so afraid of messing this up, I don't even want to try. So let me introduce you to one of my favorite quotes from turn of the century English writer G.K. Chesterton. He said the following, if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. <laughs> I want you to think about that for a minute. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Now, he, he wasn't saying this is an excuse for poor results, but he meant this. Most things in life that are really worthwhile pursuits, learning to be a good spouse, learning to parent well, learning to be a good student or to interact with others. These are journeys that you can only learn by experience. And if it's important enough to learn how to do it well, 
the process will probably involve some mess ups along the way and that's okay as long as we learn from them does that make sense if it's worth doing it's worth doing badly not to say it's okay to be bad but because that's the only way we learn from these kinds of things so here's an assignment for you this week I want you to find a friend or a family member somebody you can interact with a little I want you to pretend that you just did a practical blessing for this person and that they turned and looked at you and they said why did you do this and I want you to think and practice what is your response going to be and is there a way non-invasively but honestly you can talk about Jesus and it might be as simple as saying because I love Jesus why did you do this practice your response and what I want you to think about is a follow-up question pretend the person probes one further say it's something as simple as I you know what I, I did it because I love Jesus what do you mean by that now you have an opportunity to talk a bit about what it means and I wouldn't use the words Jesus is Lord but remember the essence of this is to say I am a follower of gives you a chance to talk about what it means to pattern your life after Jesus to be his follower now I know the assignment sounds quirky I just acknowledge that up front here but I want to say this if it feels awkward and that you don't even really want to do it with friends and family I can tell you who you and I will never have a conversation with we won't have it in the places where it really matters so I hope you will join me as we continue to wrestle with what what is the simplest way we can talk about the good news how can we be that but how can we respond graciously and authentically when those opportunities arise